Haynes. I'm the author of Open Index Protocol and a co-founder of Alexandria. And I'm thrilled to be here today to talk with you about blockchain content distribution. I'm going to talk first about the problem that Open Index Protocol solves, and then I'll talk about the system design and the incentive structure. So is anyone here um, worried about the future of freedom on the internet? <laughs> Are you worried about censorship? Yeah? What about access? Have you seen content be removed from a platform that you wanted to watch? Yeah? Um, what about money? Anybody worried about the demonetization, deplatforming issues that we're seeing? Yeah. These are huge problems, right? We were worried about these things too. And um, back in 2014, when we began this project, we thought we were going to have to educate people that things like this were even possible. <laughs> we thought no one would believe us that platforms like YouTube or Twitter would censor content, but in recent history, these things have become this huge conversation. Um, and we're talking about whether platforms that dominate public conversations should function as public utilities that cannot filter or censor content, or if they should have the same rights to selective service as other private companies do. And I think it's really interesting to think about this problem in the context of free speech. So just stick with me here for a minute, okay? In real life, we have private spaces and we have public spaces. So um, if I go into my yoga studio and I start screaming about politics at the top of my lungs, they have every right to refuse to serve me and ask me to leave. But if I go out on the street corner and do that, it's perfectly fine, even if there's somebody who's practicing yoga right next to me. It's really in public spaces that we have our right to free speech. And so, since the internet is this wonderful permissionless place, it's free and open to everyone, right? So, what's your favorite public space on the web? Anyone? Wait. Are there public spaces on the web? No, <laughs> there aren't. It's a trick question. Um, we have a bunch of platforms that kind of feel like public spaces. And maybe we think that they should behave like public spaces, but I'm going to leave the legislative debate to other people because I'm really concerned with the technical solution. The web we have today has a public directory so that we can all find one another, and HTTP is open so we, know how to, we all can know how to ask for a server and how that server is going to respond. So it's kind of public, but everything on the web, once we've navigated that directory to get to what we want, it's private because it's on a privately controlled server. This was actually by design. Um, the inventor of the web wanted people to control their own content, right? And so to get involved, people just had to run a web server. But it turned out that to share a recipe or <laughs> upload a video, people weren't gonna host their own web server. And so private companies built this vast private infrastructure to help the web scale. And it handled all that complex backend stuff that users didn't wanna do. And wow, has the web scaled. The web has really shown us the huge benefit of competition at the application layer. It's one protocol with more than a billion applications and three billion users. But as the web grew, it's become more and more centralized. So the story I'm about to tell is one of those great examples of history doesn't repeat exactly, but it sort of rhymes, right? Um, because we've seen this pattern of walled garden services proving user demand and then being supplanted by open standards before. So the historical analogy goes like this. Um, before the web to get on the internet, we had to go through AOL, Prodigy, CompuServe. These were walled garden proprietary stacks, right? Does anybody remember this? <laughs> yeah? Great. Um, if I was an AOL user and you were a CompuServe user, we couldn't interact. We didn't even see the same content, right? It was HTTP that gave us this space where we could all connect. And it worked because anyone could participate. It was a permissionless system. But because private companies built the services to help the web scale, we found ourselves back in these walled gardens. So now, for instance, if I'm an Apple Music user and you're a Spotify user, I can't share a playlist with you. In this walled garden model, apps are competing for our business based on the content of their catalogs, not based on the quality of the user experience that they're providing to us. And we may have to chase content or artists from one app to another. And this is becoming increasingly fractured as companies are pulling their content 
from other platforms to start their own streaming services. And really, how many streaming services can each household sustain, right? People are already subscribed to Hulu, Netflix, HBO Go, when in the coming years, Disney, DC, Fox, and others start their own subscription services, things are going to become even more fractured. So Elizabeth Stark gives this fantastic presentation about this historical analogy and about what she calls layer two. She says that HTTP was the layer two to TCP IP. It's what allowed the web to scale and created competition at the application layer. And that protocols like Lightning Network, and I would add Open Index Protocol, can be the layer two, the application layer for blockchains and the decentralized internet. So I'll circle back to talk more about the incentive design in the system and how it connects to layer two in a few minutes. But first, let's talk about the details of the Open Index Protocol system. So to say it simply, Open Index Protocol is a worldwide public database where anyone can publish, read, display, sell, or audit the records. The system is permissionless and decentralized, so anyone can use it, just like the web and Bitcoin. And it can handle all kinds of records, from music and video to property records, scientific data, and more. So let's talk about how we built it. So as we all know here, a blockchain is a public database of signed and timestamped statements, right? With Bitcoin, the, the statements are financial transactions. So to build Open Index Protocol, we chose a blockchain that has the intended purpose of storing data. It's called Flow Blockchain, and it was fair launched in 2013 by an anonymous developer known as Sky Angel. Its intended use case is storing arbitrary data. You can put up to one kilobyte of data in each transaction, and to do so, you pay a very small transaction fee to put that data into the blockchain. So as a permissionless and decentralized blockchain intended to store arbitrary data, Flow Blockchain is a place where anyone can publish information and content, and anyone can read or display it, but no one can change it. In essence, it's a digital public space. So what we did to create Open Index Protocol is we used the data space in the Flow Blockchain to store metadata about information and content. We use it kind of like the card catalog in a library. Open Index Protocol is exactly what it sounds like. It's an indexing specification that creates an indexed digital public space. Google is kind of the closest thing that we have in that it's effective at delivering search results because they have the largest index of the web. The web itself doesn't have an index, so all of the indexes that we have are proprietary. The closed indexes of search engines and platforms are built by the application layer services. And so because Google's index, for instance, is so large, they've been able to leverage it to give us all of these services, so it kind of feels like a protocol. We have Google Maps and Google Docs, and they all kind of integrate together, but it's not a protocol. It's all proprietary, and they're using it to sell our private data. So if we can shift that from proprietary and controlled to open, public, and controlled by the individuals who are putting stuff into it, it's gonna make a big difference. And it can solve the friction that we're talking about between private companies controlling their own platforms and public spaces allowing free speech. So now I'm gonna walk you through how the system works with good old Alice and Bob. So Alice here, she's an artist and she's hosting her own platform. Her platform is running her own daemons. Her daemon is gonna send her files, it could be music, video, whatever, to IPFS and get a hash. She's also gonna fill out her basic publisher information, name, title, descriptive info, tags, um, and she's gonna set her own terms of use and, and her pricing and she's gonna include her payment address. The daemon then signs it with her private key and sends it to the Flow blockchain. And then it's gonna propagate across the system. And then Bob over here, he's Alice's biggest fan. And he's viewing his feed on FaceTube, a fictional OIP platform. And Alice's content pops up and he's like, heck yeah, I wanna watch this. And so first, what we saw there, <laughs> was the metadata in the Flow blockchain was recognized by Facetube's OIP daemon, and it served it up, and that's why he saw it in his feed. And then when he clicked play on it, the IPFS network serves that file up to him. He sees the video, and he thinks it's fantastic, and he wants to send her a tip to encourage her to keep making content. 
So he sends her some Bitcoin. But who was it that shared Alice's content into Bob's FaceTube feed so that he would discover it? Well, it turns out it was influencer Charlie here, who's going to get a little cut of the money that Bob sends to Alice for his work. And also, FaceTube, or Dave up there, um, is the fourth party in this transaction. They're the platform that facilitated Bob consuming the content, so it's going to get a cut as well. But I just want to throw a little asterisk on this and say that Alice is in full control of what those cuts could be, so they could be zero. But because it's a two-sided market, the platforms and influencers can decide what content they're using. They could decide based on this cut if they wanted to. Um, and I also just wanted to note, sort of in the context of the upgrades to the decentralized web 3.0, if you want to call it that, that um, all of this will bring, is the way that it's shifting distribution network topography. So centralized hub and spoke distribution architecture cannot support market demand as efficiently as distributed networks can. In the current system, network speed is fragile because speed and popularity are negatively correlated. So popularity can result in slower file transfer, poor quality playback, and increased operational costs. So that's HTTP, that's the web system that we have today, the hub and spoke system. Whereas in a peer-to-peer -peer net network, popularity has a positive correlation um, with speed and quality. So the more popular something becomes, the better it is, the faster it is. Um, and so in order to serve their customers right now, web-based companies like YouTube have to maintain this vast private infrastructure, right? Each walled garden platform has to have data centers located within close proximity to their end users so that they have enough bandwidth so that that content is readily available. Um, and that's just the bandwidth side of the problem. When we look at the amount of wasted storage space that results from the inefficient shape of the current web, things look even more dire. Um, so for more on this, check out a talk by Juan Benet. Um, he gave a fantastic talk about the inefficiencies of file transfer in the current system, and it has some really great visualizations of all of this wasteful redundancy that we're talking about. So let's look at how all of this works. So here's what the walled garden system looks like now. Um, you'll see that in the that transport layer right there, only the protocol for transporting files is shared in the system. But otherwise, they're completely closed proprietary stacks. They're not sharing storage space for files that they may have in common. Um, and this is what really blows my mind when we're talking about the inefficiency part, is think about the catalogs of Apple Music and Spotify. They probably have 90% in common, and they're not sharing any resources. So the amount of bloat in the system is insane. And here is where we're going. The system is handling the objective work, the data, the file transport, and the value transport as efficiently as possible, the protocol layer. And at the application layer, applications are competing for users based on the quality of the services they offer. These applications, Alexandria, um, Caltech's ETDB, and Medici Land Governance are some of the applications that are building on Open Index Protocol right now. Um, and I'll talk more about them in a few minutes. So, now I'm going to talk a little bit about the business side of things, and I'm going to start with how this is going to impact creators and artists. Um, this is my favorite part because it makes it really genuinely possible for creators to earn a, a real living, and I think that's really exciting. So um, right now, to be a creator in the system, I have to have an individual relationship with each distribution channel I work with. I have to surrender control of my content to them, and I have to accept whatever distribution terms and pricing that they dictate to me, and they control my customer analytics. And in exchange, they distribute my content inside their Walled Garden platform. With Open Index Protocol, I'm going to publish a single copy of my content, and any front-end service can display and sell it according to my terms of use. So it could be a major front-end service. It could be, like, if you have a WordPress blog, you could share it there. It could be somebody in a social media channel. And if any of those links result in a sale, I get paid directly. I retain complete control over my terms of use, and my customer analytics belong to me. And so Part of what this means is we can meet all of the kind of current um, services and payment models that we're used to and offer some really cool new ones as well. And so there are all kinds of new ways that I can monetize my content. And this is really cool when you think about how I can change content distribution um, on, the, on the web. So let's say I have all of this footage that I shot that um, didn't make it into my movie, but there's a ton of it and it's cool. And maybe somebody else could use it to make something. I could put it all out there with some terms that say if somebody else edits it, 
um, I'll get a portion of the sales that they get when people consume that. Um, and all of those splits, this is my favorite part, are going to happen in the background and automatically. So it's going to dramatically lower my administrative burden. And um, it's really going to open up creativity so that creators can use one another's work and work together, but give each other what matters most, which is credit and money. I also want to note, while we're talking about this, the huge unserved market of content right now, of monetizable content. So um, right now, YouTube will pay about an average of a fifth of a penny per view, whereas um, like iTunes will pay you about 70 cents if you sell something for a dollar. So there is this huge unserved market of content that is worth maybe more than a fifth of a penny, but less than 70 cents, right? And I think there's a tremendous opportunity for artists to capitalize in this area. It's also worth noting that because um, it's so much more efficient than the current system, there are huge benefits for artists and audiences. So um, one benefit that we can offer is a new way to sell music. This is a pay to play a single stream. And when we were working with Emojin Heap a few years ago, she asked us to charge a penny per stream. So we did a simulation. And at that price, um, audiences will pay 50% less when consuming the same amount of content, and artists will earn seven to eight times what they're currently making from platforms like Apple Music and Spotify. Okay, so now I want to put these ideas together and talk about the economics of the system and the incentive design of Open Index Protocol. So first, some context. As we all know, blockchain is changing the economics and incentive structures of how value um, of systems and how they capture value, sorry. Um, so a few years ago, this article came out by somebody named Joel Manegro. He actually was at the conference. Um, he's not here right now, but he was here, and I got to speak with him. And I was so excited to come here because I knew he was going to be here to talk about this. Um, <clears throat> and the protocol, or the article was called Fat Protocols. And it, was, it became really important in the blockchain community to talk about how value flows through these systems. So, in this article, he talked about how the previous generation of protocols, HTTP and TCP IP, he called these thin protocols, because all of the value capture happened at the application layer, and none is captured at the protocol layer. This value could be in the form of data, like Facebook and Google, or it could actually be in the form of financial transactions or monthly subscriptions, like with um, PayPal, Netflix, Amazon, et cetera. But there's no value transmission at the protocol layer, and so there's no opportunity for value capture. All of the value capture happens at the application layer. And that's what's led to the walled garden business models that we're so familiar with today. Because in order for them to capture value and enforce their terms of use, they have to have a closed proprietary system and maintain end-to-end -end control. So FAT protocols got their name because the majority of the value going through the system is at the protocol layer. In the FAT protocol model, applications can only monetize for value add services, like changing dollars for bitcoins, because the protocol layer is what's doing the real work. So with Bitcoin, that work is value transfer, and the majority of the value capture happens at the protocol layer by the miners. The application layer can only capture value by offering additional services beyond the the protocol functionality. So if you've ever thought about how to monetize a wallet, you understand this problem, right? Um, Coinbase is the largest wallet in Bitcoin, but it's worth a tiny fraction of Bitcoin's market cap. Um, and the reason there's such a small amount of value there for them is because it's limited to those value add services. And they have to compete with thousands of other free wallet applications. So the FAT protocol model has been widely um, misunderstood and misapplied, and so I just want to be super clear that I'm not speaking ill of it at all. I think FAT protocols are awesome. I love FAT protocols. Bitcoin is a FAT protocol. We're all here because of it. <laughs> um, they're absolutely an important part of the stack, but over the last few years, we've started to see the necessity of layer two protocols for scaling and security, and to incentivize the competition among user-facing applications. Um, and so, what we've seen now over the last couple of years with every project trying to be the next FAT protocol is kind of a repeat of the walled garden problem, right? Because if you launch a protocol for a specific use case and you build an application, but nobody else has incentive to build an application, 
on that protocol, then it's functionally just another walled garden. And we know from the success of the web that competition at the application layer is key to mass adoption because it increases the quality and diversity of the user products and services. So we also believe that at scale, requiring a specific token to use an application won't work because users are only going to hold one or two reserved tokens, and these systems have to be interoperable. So what we believe is that token value will be driven by velocity, not by users holding it. FAT protocols offer, also offer no direct incentive for the developer community to create application layer products and services, which could mean that if the application layer um, lacks competitive options for end users, that um, the protocol would face the danger of severe consolidation of the application layer, which could then in turn compromise the integrity of the underlying protocol. Um, we also believe that for certain types of protocols, commoditization is going to drive the price down over time. Um, so protocol, um, blockchain protocol tokens can be used to manage um, the exchange of fungible commodities like storage as a service, distribution as a service, processing as a service, security as a service. Um, so with the combined properties of forking and interoperability, um, we think this is gonna lead to the commodification of these services and, and drive the price down over the long term. And then finally, from a fundraising perspective, projects that have raised money this way are vulnerable to instability from short convexity. So the problem goes like this. The company is holding the tokens that they're dependent on for cash flow, and they need some cash flow when the market is low. So they're faced with the double-edged sword of having to sell their tokens when the market is low, and potentially by selling their tokens, drive the price down even further. So now I'm gonna talk with you about a framework that we define called salutary protocols. For the first couple of years that we were working on our project, we really struggled to articulate the system design incentives because these models were all so new. So I just wanna take a moment to say thank you to Joel for defining the FAT protocol theory and for articulating it so well. It was a huge source of inspiration for us. So salutary protocols create opportunity for value capture at both the application and protocol layers. Salutary protocols maximize efficiency by separating subjective and objective work and empowering the marketplace of users to define their own unique combination of services and pricing. It separates all of the objective work into the protocol layer. So these are those fungible commodities, things that can be objectively measured like file storage, file distribution, mining to secure the blockchain, and the market for these will flatten to compete toward maximum efficiency. And things at the application layer are subjective. So these are things like the quality of the user experience, the quality of the content discovery or curation, um, the filtering lists. And this is what's really exciting because it's going to make companies compete for our business based on the quality of the services that they're offering us. So to say that another way, Salutary protocols leverage the benefits of interoperable base layer protocols and create financial incentive for applications to compete for end users. Lightning Network is another example of a salutary protocol. Lightning Network creates incentive for competition at the application layer between channel operators. So because while a Bitcoin user can't pick which miner will validate their transaction, they can pick their channel operator, and they're going to choose this operator based on a variety of factors. Um, channel operators will compete to serve different parts of the market based on things like the transaction amount size they offer, blockchain settlement reliability, or settlement frequency. And channel operators can also function as market makers to bridge funds if a node goes offline. I love the phrase that Patrick Byrne used to describe the salutary protocol model. He calls it a multi-stakeholder incentive model. And his company, Medici Land Governance, a subsidiary of Overstock, is using Open Index Protocol to build a property rights registry. The project began really to give um, developing and former communist countries access to property records. They were inspired by the work of a Peruvian economist named Hernando de Soto. His theory is about um, how leveraging capital is what gives the West so much prosperity. So I think this is really interesting. 70% of businesses are started by the entrepreneur taking out a loan against their home. 
Um, and so he says that the reason that countries that have adopted democratic government structures but have not thrived economically is because their system of formal property records is either so corrupt as to not function or it doesn't exist. Um, and so this project began um, for, is intended to help these people, but of course, um, it will also be able to be used for commercial real estate in the West as well. Um, and that QR code there is a presentation and demo from one of the devs working on it if you want to see more about their data model and um, check out their property rights registry. Um, the Jensen Lab at Caltech has also built an app on Open Index Protocol. We're just kind of gonna show you a little demo of it here. Um, they built this in only six weeks. Plugging into Open Index Protocol was the easiest part of doing it. Figuring out the way that they wanted it to look was the hardest part. Um, they used the spec to release 15 years of research, over 10,000 data sets. And they just published a, peer, a paper for peer review to discuss how Open Index Protocol can be used as a new model in academic data sharing. And Alexandria was built by the same team that built Open Index Protocol. It's where all records published to the Open Index can be found. So think of it like the search all, where um, Medici shows property records and Caltech shows scientific data. Alexandria shows all records published to the Open Index. Um, the Alexandria app is offline right now. We were just talking about this before I started. Um, we're building for the next release, but you can see a demo video with this QR code. And um, if you want to try a little demo yourself, use this one. We are on the precipice of a generational format shift. There is no doubt that digital media is widely loved. But in some distribution channels, physical sales still make up as much as 50%. Because of, until now, there hasn't been a standard that was open and flexible enough to serve the needs of the whole industry. And so right now, we're really standing at that moment in history when giant companies will fall and the next legendary companies will rise based on how they react to this technology. We are living in uncertain and turbulent times, but I believe the future is bright. Sunlight is the best disinfectant and blockchain and other decentralized technologies will, make, will bring more transparency and access to information and content than the world has ever seen. So check out more at oap.wiki. We're Alexandria on Twitter. I'm personally Amy of Alexandria. And we look forward to speaking with you more about Open Index Protocol and the role it can play in giving us all a public space on the internet. Thank you. So should we talk about it now? Anybody have questions? All right, I've got one. So yeah. how, how do you handle the typical control freaks who worry about the type of content that you put yeah, up there, whether it's a great be question. You know, pornography or hate speech or what have you? So um, <laughs> there, it's really interesting when you're wrestling with how do we create a public space, but how do we filter it so that people can do business on it, right? And that it's like legally compliant. And the two big questions there are DMCA for us in the States and child pornography, because for some countries, if you even have that on your hard drive, you're committing a serious crime. Um, and so, so part of what I didn't talk about in this talk was the Open Index Protocol Working Group, but that's sort of like the W3C. It manages the development of the specification and the specification going forward. And so it's going to have this, um, sort of self-auditing thing that the platforms have to do on a regular basis to show that they're complying with the, the specification rules and um, beyond just you know complying with the, the message format and schema and stuff like that, but the two rules that you have to follow to um, be in compliance in the system are to follow the terms of distribution that the creator asked for and to not distribute I think we came up with the phrase universally abhorrent content, right? You can't post videos of hunting humans for sport. You can't post child pornography. That's true. That's a very good point. So when I was talking about the, the, the layers that we built with, right, Flow Blockchain is that, that base layer blockchain that we're putting the data into, and then Open Index Protocol is that layer two, the indexing specification. 
you're not going to get to that content in Open Index Protocol because it's prohibited, but you could still find it in Flow Blockchain. Yeah. Yep. So in, ter in terms of uh, the takedown notices, copyright, some other sites are trying to manage this by encrypting the data so that the, the hosting yeah. sites effectively have no capacity to know what it is. Yeah. Um, obviously, this is decentralized, and so there's probably, does that risk not, not, is it, does it exist encrypted or non-encrypted on the, on the drive store? So the, we've been having this huge debate internally about whether or not you should put encrypted data on a blockchain, right? Because it's there forever, and at some point, it's probably not going to be encrypted anymore, right? So we just have to be very thoughtful about how we do that and what kind of data is put into it in an encrypted way. So does IOP uh, do anything to address the persistence problem, or uh, yes. <laughs> it is, it, is, it up, is it up to the content providers to provide seeds? So that's one of the other rules, actually, um, which is that as a platform in the system, so uh, Dave, Facetube, in our example with Alice and Bob, because they are a platform, they are generating revenue, right? They're handling a certain amount of the revenue in the overall system, a certain percentage of it. And that's what I was talking about those, when um, the OIPWG asks them to provide these auditing reports, part of it includes that. And so the, the percentage of content that they have to pin in the system is connected to the percentage of the revenue that they're doing in the system, right? So, um, and that's thinking about how, um, how we're all sharing the, um, the burden of running the system this way instead of the bloat of the system where it's like has all this excessive wasteful redundancy that I was talking about before where you know um, Apple Music and Spotify have these completely separate content distribution networks they could be working together and having half of the cost right and that's the, that's the idea behind that yeah yeah <laughs> Okay, so two questions, and yeah. you're going to have to forgive my ignorance. Um, can no, you go, actually go back on your slide sure. um, to the slide where you showed, like, Apple and YouTube? Yes. And, and the arrows were pointing? Apple and YouTube. That one, this right one. there. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so <clears throat> content creators are actually publishing to the OIP? Yes. Is that what it is? Yes. And so now iTunes, YouTube, SoundCloud? Whoever. Whoever it is, uh, yes. how are people on those platforms able to access, or are they not able to? Able to access. Access this well, content on OIP. Yeah, so, um, so it's Isagoria, is that right? Yeah, so, so Isagoria would be one of those platforms, and they would be, did I do Alice and Bob? In which order? Yeah, there we go. They would be... Uh, Dave or Facetube in this. And so what Isagori would do is host that OIP daemon, and by hosting that OIP daemon on a server, so you would be able to access it through the web, you would have the whole index. So you would have the Flow blockchain, you would be an IPFS node, you would have whatever you need there, your wallets and stuff. Um, and so that would all be how that works. And so then that would plug right into the front end that your users are accessing. On our side? Yes. But yes. Is there a way then for that content to also be shared into these other platforms as well? Is that what you're saying? Yes, absolutely. So if if YouTube was an OIP compliant platform and people published content through your platform, it would then also show up on YouTube. Yes, yes, and Alexandria, and and the other platforms that are being built right now. And is that is that automatic, or is someone physically having to go and do that? So sorry, is that automatic, or are people having to physically do it? So it's automatic in that the index listing is an OIP and it's available now for any platform service to display and sell on behalf of the publisher. Um, but it's up to the platform what content they display and sell. Makes sense. Yeah? What if I uh, want to find a song from a deceased singer or something? Like, who owns that content? What if your content creator dies? And so where does that value accrue? I don't know. I'm not getting um, involved 
in people's personal contracts and all of that kind of stuff, right? Like, that's part of sort of the beauty of it, frankly, to me, uh, especially from a legal perspective, is that we aren't responsible for how people use our technology. We just built it and it exists for you. It's like a public space, right? Yeah. And so you're built on the Flow blockchain. I'm yes. totally unfamiliar with them, but I mean. Totally fine. Um, I mean, so how secure is it? And if it, if it gets hacked or if it goes down, the entire system falls on its face? So, so um, this is a little bit of a complicated answer because Flow Blockchain's intended purpose is to store arbitrary data. And so when you talk about uh, uh, what could, the potential kinds of attacks that could happen to Flow Blockchain, um, there hasn't been one that can change the data in the chain. There could be theft of coins, but that doesn't change the data that's in the chain, right? So there's that benefit in terms of that. But much more importantly is this thing that we um, are in the midst of building right now. Um, so we kind of think of it, or one way I think of it as a product that would compete with auto-switching multi-pools. Um, and it's a way to defend a blockchain collectively so that all of the uh, platforms that Ben was asking about that are using the system, if the blockchain were to start getting attacked, could band together and form a collective defense. And um, so this, this idea is that the attacker isn't going to know how long this group is going to be able to hold out or it just, it creates a lot of, we think it's going to work. Come, come see us more to talk about it. <laughs> talk to, so, um, we never know when we come to these things if the schedule is going to work out for uh, us to both be able to come. This is my husband. He's um, the inventor of Open Index Protocol. So if you want to talk about the deep technical side of things, definitely come and talk to him afterward. Uh, yeah. I have one other question for you in terms of storing large data. Is the Flow blockchain actually storing some of the scientific data or just the index to an IPFS hash? Yes. It's just that, okay. Yes. That makes sense. Got it. And, and then the, the metadata, the descriptive information and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, Amy. Hi. You educated me yesterday, but I learned more today. Super. How'd I do? Who's, who's responsible for determining what content is acceptable and what content is not acceptable? At which layer? I don't care. Okay. Well, Any I'll, layer. I'll answer both then. Okay. Okay. So, um, let's see what happens if I back up. There we go. So, at, no, nah, I'm going to back up too. Where's the, um, this part, okay. So at the flow layer, the blockchain layer, anybody can put anything into that. We can't control it. They can put things in there that don't comply with the OIP specification. They can, can, people can and do, right? So that's just any anything and everything. I can the, put hate speech in there? You can put anything in there. Okay. It's, a, it's a digital public space. Okay. Yeah. OIP, is the indexing specification that, that builds a searchable index that platforms can then use to display that content, right? And so inside the OIP system, there are certain rules. We've been talking about those, about child pornography, about DMCA, these kinds of things that you can't do inside the open index protocol system. Well, those are obvious rules. Yes. About the unobvious right. rules. So you're talking about the unobvious rules. Those will be enforced by the platforms. So that's the application layer. So platforms can decide what content they host based on whatever they want. They're private spaces, right? So they can decide if they want to do it based on um, political preferences or based on just aesthetic preferences. Who knows, you know? So I can put hate, hate speech in here. Yes. And it's up to the second layer of people to decide whether they want it or not. Yes, so his question was, um, that he could put any kind of content, including hate speech, into Open Index Protocol, and that it would be up to the platforms to decide if they wanted to display it, and that's absolutely correct. Yes. Yes. Um, so if I want to patronize a specific content creator, so Madonna or somebody, whatever, yeah. uh, how do I know that it in fact is her? Is there gonna be a Twitter verification kind of yeah. scheme on there? I mean. <laughs> that uh, is exactly what it is, in fact, yeah. So. Um, um, Madonna, so to register as a publisher in Open Index Protocol, they have to do that initially, right? So, and 
if they want to be a verified publisher, they send out a tweet that has their public key in it. What does it have? Yeah, it, it loops their, their social media profile to their publisher account on OIP, so that they, it's like publicly verifying it. So Twitter controls, I mean, is in, in effect. In effect. Right. So it could be any social media platform. It doesn't have to be Twitter. Okay. And then also, as a secondary measure for you to know that it's Madonna, is that the platforms will enforce, OIP will enforce DMCA. So you wouldn't be able to get to it if the content had been put in and, and they had put up a, a DMCA and a takedown notice. Okay. Yeah. Anybody else? All right, I got one more. All right, cool. Keep it going. Um, so o OIP is searchable, like like similar to Google, I can type in, and so there's an algorithm behind that as well, and I mean, is no, that? No, that's what the application layer does. Okay. That's okay. where you make your money. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, good, great. Well, thank you so much, everybody. Enjoy the rest of the conference.